listening to Verdon Interviews, episode number one, with your host, Ken Verdon. For today's guest, we have Chris calvert Minor. Chris is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Wisconsin, Whitewater. Chris has a wide background of education, including a bachelor's master's of science in chemistry at the University of Illinois at Champaign and at the University of Minnesota at Minneapolis, as well as a master's of arts in theology from Bethel Theology Seminary and a Ph.D. in philosophy at Syracuse University. Chris has published and contributed to several publications, book reviews, academic journals, conference presentations, and received several prestigious awards from UW-Whitewater and Syracuse University in the areas of teaching and community excellence. Chris also manages his own blog, The Critically Pissed, which tackles a number of societal issues that matter to us. Much of Chris's experience and interest lies under the general label of philosophy in dealing with questions such as truth, Consciousness, Religion, Existentialism, Epistemology, Science, and Ethics. Chris and I will be having an insightful conversation today about the utility of philosophy and how this form of critical thinking may be beneficial to our lives as a value source of education. We will also be discussing existentialism and how we tend to cope and make sense of all those larger mean of life thoughts that tend to enter our minds, making us question our free will and individuality. And with that introduction... I'd like to introduce to you our charming guest this episode, Chris Calvert Minor. Alrighty, so now we got Chris Calvert Minor sitting with me today. Chris, thanks for coming on to the show. Thanks for having me. Alrighty, so we got all sorts of fun stuff to talk about today. We got philosophy, we got existentialism. We'll see where the conversation goes. So to start off with the first topic the utility of philosophy, what I mean is the reason I brought bring on this question is that I notice a lot of people will stigmatize philosophy and how useful they perceive it. And this question was first brought on to me by, I was with some relatives over last summer, and I was mentioning how a friend of mine was in philosophy classes, philosophy classes here at Whitewater I've already taken. But the idea was that they're more like thinking as like a, a useless class or something you just had to get, well, you just had to take while you're here. So this brought on this question about how people perceive philosophy. And I want to go more into why people perceive this philosophy and how it, that could be changed or how you would like to see it changed in just general public discourse and how it can be really useful to our lives and just really shape who an individual is. So getting into that, how would like how do you perceive philosophy and what do you what got you into it? Uh, what got me into it? Um <clears throat> yeah, I was gonna actually piggyback um first on there is definitely a um uh, not by all people, but there's certainly a common perception of the value and utility of philosophy um mm-hmm. that it doesn't have much um or that it's kind of scary uh philosophy is a humanities course and it is um not one of those courses that i think you would immediately think of um preparation for jobs mm-hmm. you know so a lot of people today think of university or college uh as preparation for jobs you know mm-hmm. you know career preparation and uh, you know, business classes, education classes, you know, like college of education, um, or more technical kind of fields, um, or even like bio and chem, you know, those are definitely, you know, if you want to be a chemist, well, you take chemistry. Yeah. Um, philosophy is not something, you know, and most people don't take philosophy thinking, oh, I'm going to, you know, go into philosophy as a career, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it's one of those other kind of courses. And so I've been, I'm not sure if I, well, there's times where people have asked, you know, well, why take philosophy? It doesn't really get you a job. Yeah. Um, but there's de- de- definitely a general thought of that. Mm-hmm. And so uh, not only that, but then also uh, philosophy can be quite scary. That um, what it does is it makes you think about things. Uh, it makes you be more critical. And for lots of families, if they're... Um, 
you know, if they're a kid, or they, of course, the, you know, college age people aren't exactly kids, um, that if they take philosophy, maybe what the, this course will do is make them question their, you know, beliefs. Yeah. You know? And so especially if they come from a family that is, you know, so definitely more religious, mm -hmm. um, I've seen this, that people are quite leery of philosophy because it can make people question their faith. And therefore, cause a rift in the family, um, especially, you know, if salvation's involved, then yeah. like, oh, you're not believing anymore. Uh, so, you know, so maybe your salvation's in jeopardy. So uh, there's two kinds of things. It's, it's not really job preparation and it's making you question things too much and maybe mm -hmm. going down the wrong path. Uh, okay. So that's like, I think, the, a very dominant perception. Mm -hmm. uh, why I got into philosophy and I think this goes into then answering those, I think, two challenges that are common. Uh, well, I love questioning things. Um, I have a penchant for trying to figure out what's, I don't want to say right, but what's real. Uh, truth, uh, I guess reality, or j just wanted to know what's the best thing to believe. Um, whether well, we can actually get to the truth or what real reality is, uh, certainly not all opinions are created equal. Mm -hmm. Some opinions are better than others because they are more justified. So philosophy is all about, I think, in the end, well, mm, uh, there's different points of philosophy, and we can get into this. Well, I, I think we will get into this. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the main things is to question and then to come to beliefs that are the most justified to believe. So uh, philosophy is a lot about arguments, uh, reason, support, evidence. Uh, and not a lot of evidence is empirically based. It's you know so logically you know, based. And it's all based upon, you know, I guess, something empirical in the end. But you know, just what's the best thing to believe given the stuff that we have, the resources that we have, and whether that gets us to the truth or not, we don't know. But certainly, you know, some opinions are better than others because of the support that undergirds them. Um, so, in any case, I got into philosophy because I really wanted to know things. And I didn't, I didn't want to be duped. Um, there was a time in my life where I was, I would consider myself to have been duped for quite a bit until, because I just wasn't being nearly as critical as I thought I really should be. And so, you know, one of the primary things that got me into philosophy is yeah, that kind of knowledge but then for me and so this may be more of a personality personality thing as well mm -hmm. it's exciting for me um it's interesting uh for some people thinking and questioning you know their own beliefs everyone loves questioning other people's beliefs but i think a lot of philosophy is really questioning your own beliefs that's really scary for some mm -hmm. yeah i definitely agree too when i first got into philosophy as well I grew up for a long time just kind of accepting th certain things about my life and just the way things were. And I really carried an opinion that everyone's opinion matters. And what is more shape shifted into now is the idea that everyone has a right to their opinion, but backing up those opinions are something else. And I think that the scary thing about philosophy compared to, let's say, STEM or any other more practical knowledge is that things like math, engineering, all that kind of stuff, part of life. It either it works or it doesn't if you do it correctly and it's all theory too but i mean with this with philosophy it's more about dealing with how we think and how we reason and that's much more intimidating because it can really change the way how you perceive the world whether that be good or bad or even both sometimes or sometimes it'll leave you with a like it'll open these doors for you about how you perceive something originally and now you can perceive it um, completely entire like entirely different so I think that's certainly an interesting area that opened up me to philosophy when I first was introduced to it. And it's something that can seem so grand and intimidating to people, but I think it's something that the general idea behind it is a lot to do with critical thinking. Yeah, uh, I agree with you that everyone has uh, a right to their own opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but I would actually say, and their opinions matter too. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, not all opinions are well supported, mm -hmm. but I think giving opinions, you know, giving people's own beliefs on things is useful because then it's another perspective to consider, mm -hmm. even if it's not justified, but then you can consider it because maybe the person just, a person will have a belief and that person doesn't have a good justification for it, but maybe there's a good justification elsewhere for it. But then hearing the opinion itself 
is something to consider. Mm -hmm. It's like, so in philosophy, you know, I totally agree with you. you know, the critical thinking aspect of things is paramount. But what I found really exciting about it as well is seeing different meadows of thought. You know, seeing different ideas because a lot of times, you know, so you talk about growing up in you know, a certain high family. Uh, you know, a lot of people grow up in a family which, you know, they're taught usually, you know, there's one kind of way of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. And face it, you know, the way people usually um, grow up is that there's a right and a wrong. Yeah. So it's like a very Manichaean. Um, there's good, there's bad. You know, so like dichotomous or binaries. Mm -hmm. Good and bad, right and wrong, uh, true and false. Um, a lot of the sciences tend to be that way um, and math you know certainly lower level math tends to be that way higher level math is I guess a little bit different but mm -hmm. um, uh, philosophy it helps you it expands things uh, mm -hmm. the perspectives um, it, so different meadows of thought and mm -hmm. so I find that to be really exciting especially when there are things oh so you know so straight and narrow with things that you've not, never considered before mm -hmm. which is the value I one of the great values of school. Uh, high school, I don't know it anymore um, of what they're really doing there, if they're really challenging and trying to think in different kinds of ways. I think in some classes, certainly that's the case, but college, I think, should certainly be the case. Because um, if you're not going to get it now here, you know, when you're out of college uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's not like, you know, philosophy courses that, you know, just, you know, around yeah. the corner, you know, when you're out of, of school, mm. um, you don't get these kind of different perspectives. I mean, you do talk with people and usually colleagues and friends and family and stuff like that. But philosophy, I think, uniquely has these different kind of perspectives built into it, you mm -hmm. know, that to consider things because we're trying to figure some stuff out. But stuff that's, you know, different, you know, like meaning of life, mm -hmm. um, you know, what's, tr you know, what, what is, what is truth? Um, and what is it, you know, do we have free will? Or are we really determined? Mm -hmm. And so these kinds of issues come up. And there are a lot of things that people haven't considered before. When I teach intro to philosophy, uh, most people have never considered, you know, all the different kind of aspects. You know, so I mentioned free will determinism or, you know, what are we really? You know, do we have a spirit or are we just physical? And mm -hmm. then the supporting kind of arguments for each side. And so a lot yeah. of people don't consider those. Yeah, I think all those topics are very important, too, because with people that really haven't taken any philosophy or haven't really questioned those parts of their lives, even if they didn't change their minds, at least just observe them, it's something that they kind of view those things as just like a part of life, but something that's almost not that important. And I think thinking about these things should be a very important part of your life and even just considering these things because it can really just change um, your outlook on life, too. And I remember looking back because I, I took philosophy with you some three years ago um, here at Whitewater and there's a lot of these questions that were something that was always in the back of my mind but my idea is that with many of these heavier topics especially in philosophy they'll always be in the back of someone's mind and there'll be times where they'll be itching about it but they'll never really heavily um, like go into those types of topics and try to understand them more and um, so I, th I would imagine that that's part of just the scariness of it too. But yes. I think that if you, especially with like a course or some, someone that's just more experienced with understanding or communicating philosophy, it can be a very, um, exciting and rewarding experience too. Yeah. It's almost like a guide. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not saying that, you know, so if I'm the instructor, it's not like I have all the answers at yeah. all or really any answers, I guess. Uh, but there's, it's like facilitating discussions yeah. and facilitating ideas and then to navigate through the ideas. Um, I like doing class as, you know, like a back and forth discussion. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like I'm the expert up there and, yeah. and here's what's right, but it's a back and forth. Yeah, and the thing I like that you do too, from my experience, is that you won't give your opinions on the heavier topics like, oh, do you believe in God? Um, do you believe in a soul? Um, brain and bats or anything like that you'll introduce these heavier topics but then you'll allow you'll bring on both sides of them and then or more sides if there are and then let the students think for themselves and i find it really interesting because you'll see people that won't realize what they've been thinking all these years until they say it out loud and sometimes their opinions they might think like oh this is ridiculous i've been thinking this way for this long or i can't believe i never noticed this and Usually some of those things cannot be realized until discussion is made on these topics mm. as well.
have you had any instances where maybe a student came up to you after a class or a course and just really expressed interest with these ideas more or said that they started shifting some of their perspectives or encountered new perspectives they didn't think about? <laughs> yeah, all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm very explicit that I, to my courses, especially intro, intro to philosophy, mm -hmm. it's not my, like, it doesn't matter what I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to be honest, if I just said, you know, this is what I believe and this is what's right, that's not, that doesn't, doesn't convince anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and so you give people the means to figure it out for themselves, to think for themselves, to wonder about what they're, they've been thinking. You know, you're saying they've been mm -hmm. thinking all this all, you know, for so long and then they, they change. Uh, and I've had that many times. So I, I usually don't, in fact, even at the end of the course, I never really give my views on things. Sometimes people come up and say, all right, now the course is over. What do you believe? <laughs> and a lot of times, though, I don't give it still because, well, because they usually, um, if they get the, the, the bug of philosophy, then they'll usually maybe take some yeah. more classes with me. And so I want to keep the kind of, I don't know, not a wall, but just this opacity with what I believe so that people can figure that out for themselves yeah. because you can't just, you can't make someone believe something. They have to come to it themselves. But lots of people, yeah, they do change. Yeah. And do you, would you think this changing process, and I'm specifically talking about larger philosophical issues, do you think it's something that people tend to realize right away or something that they might not even realize until like say months later that they think this way now or something that's just been intake, like integrated as part of their thinking habits and their lifestyle about just how they approach issues now? I think it's both and. Mm -hmm. uh, some people do it uh, immediately. Uh, different people are at well, obviously different places mm -hmm. in their thinking process, um, different places in life. Mm -hmm. uh, some have been thinking about things for a while already, mm -hmm. and then maybe you know some of the philosophy that we do in the courses, it sparks them to take that extra step um, or a missing piece in their thinking process. For some people, uh, they've never encountered any of this before, mm -hmm. and then they they're in some some ways they're reeling in their heads. Mm -hmm. um, they they don't know what to do with it yet. Um, even though you know, we're going through the course, we're going, you know, I haven't write papers on certain kinds of things, but a lot of the papers I see, they're really trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So for some, they say, yeah, I, I didn't realize this and they change right away. So mm -hmm. for some people, uh, you know, the thought of planting seeds, mm -hmm. um, you plant a little something and then possibly months, possibly even years later, like uh, a colleague of mine who's uh, re retiring now, but David Cartwright, um, he's had former students email him years later saying just how valuable his course was and how the, that course ended up really changing, you know, things of their thinking. Because mm -hmm. some of the, you're saying, you know, the heavy topics, the heavy questions, what someone, you know, where someone lands on that is a big deal. Uh, so, you know, like one big topic is the existence of God. Yeah. And so if someone decides, oh my gosh, yeah, I do believe in God or I don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's a life changer kind of thing because mm -hmm. that really matters for worldview stuff. And for many people, it, it may take a bit for them yeah. to really sink it in. But that's what, I mean, that's the point of the course, just to make them think about it and mm -hmm. whether or not they change now or change later or they don't change. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people will take some of the arguments we do for and against God's existence and really use it for what they already believe, which mm -hmm. is fine because um, maybe it will lend more support to what they believe. But yeah, so I see a range of things. So for this process of, because I'd like, um, like to get back onto this a bit more, but I'd also like to dive into the idea of going about these discussions. Um, it sounds like you're more of a fan of like a Socratic method where instead of just saying, this is what I believe, this is how things are, these are your options. It's more about instead of going into um, a way that could be like a new perception of life or a new belief. You instead like to deconstruct what people might already believe and then try to help them think, how did they get to that point? Uh, maybe not necessarily how they got to the point, but to, so I usually, uh, like, so for my intro course, it's very topic based. Mm -hmm. And so like, for instance, the, our, the first unit I do is on the existence of God. And 
I usually say, you know, people usually have default beliefs mm -hmm. and they don't really question those beliefs very much. Mm -hmm. And so our job is to really question the crap out of them. Yeah. Uh, and to not really why they may have come to those beliefs, but then where they are now, you know, critique them mm -hmm. and then to, and then kind of see where it goes. Yeah. And that's exciting to do. And for someone like, let's say I'm brand new into this, I haven't done any philosophical thinking and I have whatever my predetermined beliefs are. And let's assume that those beliefs have just been a part of my life since I was a young child and I've just never really thought about them. I've just accepted them. Let's say I express like some concern to you. I just like want to get into philosophy, but I'm really concerned or scared about how my beliefs could be changed. Or let's say I even have a false belief that you're going to like, um, coerce me into belief instead of just simple discussion and persuasion. What, like, how would you respond to someone like that? That's just simply nervous about getting into philosophy. Yeah, there's a um, <laughs> there was a movie that came out a few years ago called God's Not Dead. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Yeah. Um, where there's a philosophy professor there who's really just a jerk, mm -hmm. um, staunch atheist, and basically just says that's what's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've had some people wonder, is the course going to be like that? And, um, you know, because there's like a coercive element, almost like a bullying element with that. Yeah. And no, um, you know, I usually say, well, first of all, that's, that's <laughs> not philosophy. I mean, yeah. there's no philosophical thing, but that's not the way I believe philosophy should be done. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, so very uncoercive or non-coercive. And... Oh, I lost what I was saying or thinking on that one. Yeah. While well, you're thinking about that, just to uh, describe to our audience that might be unaware of the differences between coercion and persuasion. Coercion would be more along the lines of, like you said, like a bullying, a forceful method to make someone change their opinion where they're not really doing it. They're doing it because of some other reason, like another maybe blackmailing reason. But persuasion is genuinely changing someone's opinion through just discussion and reasoning out on different topics. And even if they're right or not, um, maybe their outcome of that persuasion, it's not forceful. And I think that's a key thing that leads to good philosophy is using persuasion instead. And where the guy's not that example, that's a clear example of coercion. Yeah, uh, but even with the persuasion thing, uh, whatever arguments we're doing, mm -hmm. I usually try to champion the argument. So I try to persuade mm -hmm. in whatever kind of, you know, belief, you know, so if it's God's existence, mm -hmm. if I'm doing arguments for God's existence, I try to persuade people that that's the right view. Mm -hmm. Then when I switch gears and you know, do arguments against God's existence, I try to persuade people that that's the right view. Mm -hmm. Letting them fully know I'm playing the side, like I, I have a role to play. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't try to persuade them in any particular direction. Mm -hmm. I do use persuasion, but through the arguments. Uh, what I was, what I wanted to say, which I had momentarily forgot, uh, I do tell people though you shouldn't be scared. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to do coercion. I'm not going to try to persuade you into one particular kind of viewpoint. But the point is, is that if something's true, then it doesn't matter how much you critique it or question it. Mm -hmm. If it's true, it should hold up. And so then that's what you'd want to do. So, and, you know, people very, you know, get very leery, you know, you can try to change my beliefs about God. No. Mm -hmm. What I want you to do is critique things. And if, say, belief in God or not belief in God is true, mm -hmm. then that should hold up in the end. Yeah. Um, would So would you say that just, yeah, like you said, with the how does it hold up? You're not forcing someone to change your opinion. You're just deconstructing each side or sides of a topic and how um, they make they make sense to someone like let's take an uncontroversial example of a student saying that I genuinely believe the earth is flat most people will not agree with that philosophy and it'd be pretty easy to deconstruct but it's something that you're not forcing them to believe that the earth is flat you're just taking a picture and they say well we don't know that that picture is real like how we even know we've been in space I haven't seen a rocket go off in space I haven't met I haven't been in space myself. So, and someone might respond to that saying that, well, there's a substantial amount of reasoning to believe this. Or um, instead of, where like other topics, there's 
a lot of confusion or a lot of just the unknown with it, so, some other area too. It's um, all about the support yeah. and the evidence. Yeah, so flat earth views have very little support, even mm. though I know there are people out there who will try to champion it. But mm -hmm. um, again, it's, I think the, the view matters mm -hmm. in terms of giving a different perspective, mm -hmm. but then you, know, you, know, you counterbalance that with other kind of perspectives and see which one holds up in the end. And yeah. so you put it all out on the table, mm -hmm. or as much as you can. I mean, there's gonna be so many views on any given topic and you mm -hmm. can't do them on them all. You do the main ones and then you see you know, which one rises to the top. And so, but I let the students then determine for themselves which mm -hmm. one rises to the top. Yeah, because I think that especially with the um, the religion or God debate, one thing I see that's kind of depressing is um, when I see, let's say, a Christian and an atheist want to debate, and let's say they're not used to debating, they're not even used to the philosophical thinking. Let's say one grew up in a Christian family, one grew up in a secular family, and that's just their circumstances. But then the Christian might say to the atheist, oh, you'll, you you think you're so smart, you'll just never believe in God, why even bother? And then the atheist will say to the Christian, like, oh, you're just so full of yourself, you're all high and mighty with your God, like, like you, you're obviously not going to listen to me. So I think that these kind of, like, that's not a philosophical thinking, that's just accepting the positions you're at. So if you should get to those positions, then it's something that should be more of just like a, a common discussion, like in, instead the Christian asking the atheist, like, why don't you believe in God? How did you get to that point? Or how did your family get to that point? Or have you ever considered the idea? And then the same from the atheist to the Christian of, why do you believe in this God? Or what does it do for you? Or maybe, and that way, like, people aren't black and white. And a lot of people, even if their ideas might seem stupid to you when you first approach them, there's usually something there that is involving them in to like their belief they have, especially if it means a lot to them. Yes. I, I think the, the key thing there is there needs to be a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, people can be very dogmatic in their beliefs, you know, not listening to the other side genuinely. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of like mocking or um, discounting the other view and like being disparaging mm -hmm. and that uh, th that doesn't go anywhere because you want to have an open conversation you want to try to listen to the other side as best as possible. Yeah. Um, and then ask, you know, well, mm -hmm. yeah, so why'd you come to this view? You know, so what's the support for it? Mm -hmm. And then go from there. But it's, and, and you see our conversations in America, and especially, you know, online chat rooms and all that, mm -hmm. or comment sections. People are so yeah. anti actually listening to the other side. Yeah. You know, they're more interested in tearing down the other side than actually yeah. having any genuine conversation. Yeah, I think that's a major problem too where people think that like they've already made up their mind, they're not going to admit that, they're not going to change their mind, but they'll almost like want to, for the people that um, are more malicious with this, they'll approach a conversation framing it like a conversation, but really it's they want to deconstruct the other side without listening to them just to point in and say like I'm right or I've won. And even when it comes to like things like debating that we do in the philosophy classes, um, and you can tell me your thoughts on this, is I think the purpose they serve is to per like bring in new perspectives on topics and not just which side wins or which side got closer to winning the conversation. I don't think that anyone that's ever won a debate like with the self-proclaimed, like I won, like that statement alone has ever changed anyone's mind. It's the content of the debate itself. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, one other aspect I wanted to bring in, uh, so we talk, and we need to go back to the value of thinking, okay. um, but, uh, the value of philosophy, um, I find, you know, so the three kind of values I find value in, in just thinking well, you know, so there's a lot of logic based reasoning, um, you know, bringing, bringing in evidence and then having different kinds of arguments to, to give, um, while also recognizing there's lots of fallacies that people give, mm -hmm. right? So the, this general umbrella of logic. Then also different perspectives, you know, perspective garnering, where you see different meadows of thought and you see just, you know, that all the different kind of ways people can think about certain kind of topics. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times people say, you know, well, there's maybe just two sides to a topic or not even two sides, there's just one side the way to think of things. And so you can really expand that out, uh, which, bleeds into then that's better thinking because you want to see better sides, but then also bleeds into, and this is something which I've, you know, over the past, say, I don't know, 
five, six years, it's really struck me more. And I've said this more in my, in my classes. Uh, the world's just a really weird place. Mm -hmm. uh, things that seemed really set in stone and concrete really aren't. Mm -hmm. And philosophy can make the world that, so for me, was in some, some sense kind of boring. It was just kind of, it was there, mm -hmm. but it opens it up into all these, like, it's just mysterious. Like, we don't know a lot of things. Uh, we don't know, you know, do we really have free will or not free will? You know, mm -hmm. even like, do I have hands and how do I know they're mine? And what does it mean to say they're mine? You know, mm -hmm. am I, like, what am I? You know, subjectivity and identity, you know, like, like what am I? That it makes the world weird and interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think philosophy, it makes the world a more interesting place. And since we only have a certain amount of time here, mm -hmm. I think one great value is just it, it makes life a little bit more enjoyable. It can make life suckier um, in that maybe some things that you wanted to believe mm -hmm. no longer really hold up under, uh, you know, under the muster, mm -hmm. that you need to change things. And so it can be disconcerting. Philosophy can be bad for your health at times because yeah. it can make you think of things that maybe you didn't really want to go in that direction, but then that's where the arguments go. And if you want to be a person of good integrity with logic, you should probably go in that direction, even though you don't want to. Yeah. So, so it's like the thinking aspect, the different perspectives that different perspectives and ideas aspect, but then also like the wonder and mystery aspect of just the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. We don't know a lot. Like even like why we have consciousness and what self consciousness really is. Mm -hmm. It's just a weird thing. And so, philosophy uncovers that. Um, and different philosophers have made more of this, like Martin Heidegger. Uh, mm. It just, the world isn't so set in stone. Yeah. And I think that I, I definitely agree too with the thinking part and different people do react differently to it. Um, and even over the course of their life, like with me, I started off with the idea, this is exciting. And I was looking into then doing the whole kind of joking, like, oh, I'm having an existential crisis here. And, um, or then I'll think like, oh my God, I actually am. <laughs> have like a legitimate existential crisis here and it's something that will like always be in the back of my mind for like a like a year or two um about what do i really believe and then i would um for some of my beliefs i've had um i would cling on to those beliefs because i would convince myself that i have to believe in this way or like let's say that someone convinces themselves that they're just a sad person by nature and that might be the case, but um, other times too, they might have just not been exposed to a different way of thinking about it, or they've um, cemented that idea so much into their head that that's just the way they are. So they're not really thinking about it, but they're just like convinced or some of that things that I can't um, imagine a universe where Pluto's not a planet. So like maybe trying to persuade them that Pluto's not a planet would be like the hardest thing to convince them of, um, or just other... <laughs> like joking situations like that so that can reflect more upon like real um serious situations of how people perceive life and i've even noticed that with myself personally my outlook on life has been a lot more exciting because i did go into that realm of th things seem more boring when i think about it this way from a philosophical point but then i um it was almost like I was going through like a tunnel, like it was like I was in a desolate landscape where everything was more concrete of how I believe things, going through a tunnel where like, oh, this is it now. But then like I got onto the other side of that tunnel and now it's like this more expansive landscape of, oh, this will open up all these other different areas of thinking that I never even considered before or was not even a reality of my consciousness that I could have even comprehended before just because it just never occurred to me in that way. And... So I think that thinking and like the planting the seeds, like you said before, too, that's a very interesting way of how people will open their mind to new things, whether it's good or bad. And uh, you know, to, to continue this, uh, it, it makes someone a more interesting person. I agree. And, and I think, so, yeah, we addressed, you know, people thinking, you know, philosophy is scary and changing beliefs. And philosophy is not about changing beliefs. It's really mm -hmm. about just finding out which beliefs have the most support and, mm -hmm. and trying to hold those. But then, you know, the other side, you know, philosophy isn't really good for jobs. It's yeah. not really job training. Well, I completely disagree. Uh, it's not job training in terms of practical skills in a particular kind of discipline or area. It's not mm -hmm. like, you know, business skills or something. But there, there's two prongs to it. Um, I think 
philosophy, it, it opens your mind up to different things about the world. And so it makes you more interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes you one that you're more, hopefully more open to considering other kind of viewpoints. But then you, you've thought through some of these viewpoints and you've thought through why you believe what you believe mm -hmm. a little bit more. And that makes you more interesting. It, you have things to say. You have things to talk about, uh, and not just you know say normal things, but like you know you're more self-reflective, mm -hmm. uh, and so you're able to uncover things about your own self, and then maybe even about other, you know why other people believe what they believe. Um, but so that makes you more interesting, not to you know uh, not to minimize and the value of the thinking that goes in the process. Mm -hmm. And so philosophy makes you a better thinker. The more you do philosophy better thinking you can do. Mm -hmm. And as I say, you know, often in my classes, and that helps in everything, every part of your life. Mm -hmm. So whatever job or career you're doing, better thinking helps. Mm -hmm. uh, being a more interesting person helps, uh, especially, I keep thinking, you know, for job interviews, for, sh for sure. I mean, you might be able to bring up things which other people wouldn't usually bring up. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you don't force these kinds of things, but it, it's, it's an attractive kind of thing. Yeah, and so you can think better, and you have this you know interesting kind of quality that you can cultivate. So these kinds of aspects help everywhere, mm -hmm. in, in everywhere, in every place in your life. Mm -hmm. And so, for people that say you know well, it's just a humanities thing, and you know it, it should be more job stuff, philosophy does that, just not in the way that people are accustomed to, mm -hmm. but it definitely does that. And not only that, but you know I've seen articles written from the business community that philosophy is good business, um, yeah. where businesses, you know, so employers look for people that, uh, so for one thing, you know, the term is that people aren't deers in headlights when it comes to approaching problems. Yeah. That they're able to then take a step back to then see, you know, are the different perspectives to take on problems, uh, to be resourceful, to be um, uh, imaginative into how to approach things. Mm -hmm. So the business community has already said they like these kinds of people. Uh, so, yeah, I so I I I'm very well aware that you know certainly our our current government um, wants you know our education to be very instrumental in getting the jobs, mm -hmm. and it is. Mm -hmm. uh, philosophy is in, it's part and parcel of that. So it's not something that's divergent from it, but. So it's there, but philosophy has its own value in making one more, more interesting person and making life more interesting. So, yeah. you know, again, we have a certain amount of time here already. You know, it's, we don't live forever mm -hmm. on earth, um, whatever your beliefs are afterwards. And so w philosophy is something, and I'll say it should be what it sh people should take this or they should delve into it because I think it makes life more interesting for the person. More, it makes it more enjoyable. Yeah. And I agree completely, too, with one of my favorite quotes was uh, from you. And this is still something I remind myself every day. And I'll get more into, like, how the practical purposes of how philosophy helps, too. But um, I think it's something along, along the lines that you said that um, everything you've ever heard from anyone could always be wrong. <laughs> and the way I interpret that is not to say, like, not to be cynical with literally everything of, um, oh, yeah, like, cold is my favorite drink. Well, how do you really know it's your favorite? No, I don't. Like, um, it's just more of a way of thinking that if something makes me question something or something, like, something just doesn't seem quite right, it's perfectly fine to look more into it and to wonder why this is a norm or this is what's considered, like, concrete um, with how things should be done um, about just why, why people do things or just learn more. And sometimes you'll learn that those things are right and sometimes you'll learn that things are wrong. Um, but yeah, it's really helped me just even on the more mon like practical and mundane situations of really helping me just sit back and reflect patterns and reflect reality and observe it better, whether it's with patterns of how I think or actual situations I'm in. Like even one really mundane situation with me where I do believe philosophy helped me like philosophical thinking and critical thinking was that I used to have a fear of dancing publicly. And at the time, I always just knew that I would get these nervous, giddy feelings whenever I dance. Dancing? Yeah, just dancing. <laughs> and so I did not like the idea. I convinced myself that I'm just not a dancer. That was my conclusion for like the first 20 years of my life. 
And when I started thinking more of a philosophical way, I just identified what made me nervous about dancing. And was it something that was inherent to me? Or was it something that I just felt I needed more practice on dancing? And I realized that I was able to better understand my concern of the issue and where my jitters were coming from, even that I that just seemingly came onto me unconsciously. And I figured out that um it, still work in progress. But it's something that <laughs> you're gonna, gonna show me some moves. <laughs> eh, maybe not right now. I'm a bit nervous with dancing, it's not my thing. But um <laughs> Yeah, it's where I was able to just identify, just even in simple situations like that, like observe why I felt nervous. And I agree, like on a much more realistic scale, like with businesses, you're mentioning it's you can problem solve better. You can identify trends and patterns of what's going on. You can understand where someone's coming from, where you could just easily label off of, oh, this is that this person's problem. It's easy to see. But then you look into it, and it's like, oh, no, there's much more to what's going on here than what meets the eye. So I think that, yeah, it's a lot of philosophical thinking should be like a mandatory skill that we should learn. It's something that um, you, you don't have to, like, teach specific beliefs, like, if someone doesn't want to. Like, but even if someone, like, let's say that is really nervous and just refuses to learn to ask the bigger philosophical questions, Still, philosophy is for them. It's for everyone that has a thinking brain. Yeah, I, philosophy is 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 itself a skill. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the you know, the dancing thing. It sounds like there's probably a lot of psychology going on there. Yeah, I mean, not necessarily possible. philosophy as as much, but the general process of being self reflective. Yeah, and then looking for you're saying patterns and stuff or mm -hmm. reasons for why. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a general philosophical approach yeah. to things. Um, yeah. You know, so, and I, sh I should mention because you're bringing up dancing, and then there's a lot of psych psychological stuff. You know, philosophy is its own discipline, but it bleeds into everything else too. Yeah. Um, so it's not like there's philosophy and then there's psychology. I mm. mean, there's lots of there's overlaps um, bleeding in. So philosophy, and even the, there's a, a trending thing in, in universities, you know, for inter interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity. Um, philosophy is very amenable to that kind of. Uh, you know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. So with existentialism, talking more about that, uh, first of all, a lot of people, even myself, probably has a bad definition of it. Could you just um, give us the basics of what existentialism is? <laughs> That's the, always the million-dollar question. Yeah. Uh, existentialism, the definition that I work with, though, you know, I, Different existentialists would probably balk at this, but um, it's the phenomenological study of the concrete, living, existing individual. Mm -hmm. So when I give that definition, so the phenomenological study of the concrete, living, existing individual, mm -hmm. so you start at the back. So existentialism is always about the person. Mm -hmm. So this is a philosophy in a sense of the individual. Uh, and so what kind of individual? Well, one who exists um, and, and so uh, someone who's alive, but then the particular. So this is not about society. Uh, you know, some existentialists will broaden it a little bit um, and, and start bringing in social relations. But existentialism really starts with the person, you know, one's own subjectivity, uh, you know, from, from inside to, to think of what does it mean to be a human from the inside looking out, rather than more scientific perspectives, which treats humans as objects. Mm -hmm. So we certainly, we have a perspective. We have um, a, our experience, our subjectivity, right? Mm -hmm. From inside uh, looking out. And so the existential starts there. Mm -hmm. Is, you know, there can be many problems, but let's start there and then let's figure out what's going on. And so the phenomenological study, what that means, you know, so, the experience that we have, it's a certain kind of phenomena. You know, we we have the five senses, and you know, if you want to, you know, and different people will tack on some other ones, but you know, we, you know, like right now, you know, I I have sight, you know, so my manifold of experience includes sight, sound, you know, taste, touch, smell, and so that is a phenomena. And so, what 
the existentialist does is analyzes what is going on there. You know, what are the strictures, the structures of what goes into that? And then what can we, you know, what kind of conclusions can we come from? You know, can we bleed from that? So, and, but different existentialists will then analyze this in different kinds of ways. Now, mm -hmm. there's some, I think, a general trend. It's definitely, existentialism is a branch of phenomenology, which phenomenology is the study of, you know, so phenomena. But then existentialism really relegates that down to the individual. And what does it mean? And so meaning of life questions, mm -hmm. um, those are, you know, really in, in the wheelhouse of existentialism. Mm -hmm. So that's how I kind of start things. This is a okay. nice definition. So I'd like to definitely deconstruct this topic more. So I'd like to go a bit into the history of it and how it relates to humans. And then we can maybe go more into areas about how people approach these topics or how people think about these topics, even saying in, in an environment where they never really talked about them before or in an environment where they're more like knowledgeable on these topics and just how different people might approach this area and what it means. So. Um, getting into the history, first, a question I'd like to know is, unless we encounter aliens, do you think this <laughs> existentialism is more a unique thing to humans? Like, it's something that animals, like, could animals experience this? Or is this, like, I, I simply just generally don't know, or is something that I didn't really know? And, and I think that has to do more with the consciousness is what I'm asking. Uh, good question. I, so... I make a decision, well, not, not just myself, but uh, many people do. Um, there's a distinction between consciousness and self-consciousness. Okay. So, you know, so like an ant would have some semblance of consciousness. Uh, an ant is aware of its surroundings to an extent. Uh, certainly it's not aware as, you know, as expansive as, say, maybe um, a bird, but certainly an ant has you know some sort of some sort of awareness and birds have awareness and so that's consciousness they're conscious of things that's going on so awareness I'm, i kind of give that as interchangeable but it's a very different kind of thing to be conscious of oneself and so when you're conscious of oneself it's like a it's a relational kind of maneuver that's what is self-consciousness you become aware of that and other kind of animals we know do have this kind of awareness. Uh, hmm. Dolphins, um, elephants, uh, certain primates, uh, they have self-consciousness. Uh, whether it's developed to our extent or not, probably not. Though I do know that some people will really go to the mat, say, oh, no, their self-consciousness is just, you know, is like ours in some sort of way. Who knows? But uh, if there's aliens, of course, not really a matter of if, but just where. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it would be the same thing. Uh, do they have some sort of awareness of their own self? It's not saying what the self is, mm -hmm. but kind of awareness of the source of the consciousness. So for my own self, you know, I have a consciousness and therefore, and but not therefore, but and then I'm also then aware of the source of my consciousness, which I, I then call myself. Mm -hmm. And then we try to, you know, I try to analyze myself in certain kind of ways. So I think this can apply to some animals. Uh, I think one can have an existential kind of analysis of what it's like to be a dolphin. Mm -hmm. uh, though we'll never be able to know it. Yeah. So maybe it's not something that, an analysis that we can perform, but you know, these other species could then perform this yeah. if they also then have the requisite kind of conceptual schemes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we have rationality mm -hmm. and we have thinking, we have, we have language and a pretty developed language. Uh, other species have languages mm -hmm. or at least they can communicate uh, with each other. Uh, that may just be a behavioral kind of thing, but we certainly have a developed language we have concepts, and so we're able to do this. Whether others can do it or not, I have no clue. And yeah. to be honest with you, I'm not sure it matters because you know, it's understanding our own selves is rife with you know fruit, um, and we've not gotten to the bottom of, in my mind, what does it really mean to be a human? Yeah, I definitely agree with that too. It's that when I 
from uh, my point of view, when I observe like just animals or we've heard situations like elephants can mourn their dead. So there's right con like there's a self consciousness there, but it, it seems like it's more on a gradient about we don't know exactly where certain animals or species might lie on that gradient, but we can kind of have an idea of which ones start putting it, like and push into that category of like the difference of an ant and an elephant on consciousness. But even with um, humans, um, we don't know what we're capable of with understanding these things. And it's still like a very misunderstood or confused um, concept um, in this area too. Like we're, we're still learning more about it, but there's still, we have, um, we still have yet to learn a lot about just our own self-consciousness. Yeah, we're, we're we are very weird creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, what the concept, one of the concepts in existentialism, which has has I guess intrigued me, is you know, so who you are in some sense, you feel like is you're close to it, mm -hmm. you know, because like my identity, well, it's mine, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm really close to my identity, like it's really close to it, and you know, for, and every person feels like they kind of know him or herself really well um, in a way. I mean, you could say, yeah. well, I you know, kind of question things. So, you know, do you really know yourself terribly? So, I mean, you can question these things, but it's still, it's a really close thing to you. Yeah. But the problem is, is that when you really try to, to grasp it, mm -hmm. you know, so if you really try to self-reflect deeply, and it's like, okay, well, what am I or who am I? Mm -hmm. It's really slippery. It's like that, you're, it's like something you're trying to grasp, always grasp, but it's always out of your reach. Mm -hmm. Or it's like, it, once you think you've got it, it vanishes. It's like it's like an infinitely vanishing point. You mm -hmm. get closer and closer, but you're never ever getting it. And the question is, is it even there? Yeah. You know. So, you know, w maybe these identities are just kind of narrative constructions that we give uh, yeah. for whatever reasons to help us function. To you know, certainly having an identity is important for living in society. You know, driver's yeah. license, and you have you know your name, right? Yeah. And that's who you are. But Extensions, you know, it really pushes you, pushes one to really figure out, well, who is, you know, who, yeah, who is one? <laughs> it's yeah. terrible to say. Um, uh, like, who am I? Yeah. And it, it's not so clear. Yeah. And I think just to continue on to that to show, like, how unclear it can be, there's just so many different ways of which people will be convinced they'll usually use certain kinds of labels about what makes them them like as an individual and a lot of times a lot of those labels are not continuous they're, they're something that could easily be changed in any given thought experiment too like you take uh, reincarnation you're now a different species are you still you <laughs> you have your memory wiped one day um you you fall hit, bump your head you have no recollection of anything and you have to like relearn as if you're just born again is there still gonna be like things that were part of your personality before that will continue to persist or even to me, the most perplexing one is people that um, have had situations where, like, the, the like I, I don't remember the part of their brain, but their brain can be split in half and they'll react differently to different situations. Or, simple case, someone has split personality disorder. We mm -hmm. also saw the M. Night Shyamalan film, so I was split. So, <laughs> whether that's accurate or not, I don't think it will get that level of superpowers by the end of the movie. Spoiler alert. But <laughs> it's something where someone that just has multiple personalities would they have multiple souls too would they have oh my gosh like... i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i mean the whole soul talk is a different kind of category yeah. uh the uh, but what you were saying about you know what defines one mm -hmm. um you know we tend to identify ourselves well i guess our society we tend we're very materialistic right yeah. We tend to identify ourselves by the things that we, we own or do. Mm -hmm. uh, these, you know, people identify themselves by their jobs or, you know, to be really shallow, I guess, you know, a car they drive yeah. or uh, their boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, yeah. wife, um, uh, not necessarily pets, but you know, some people, yeah, pets. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, pets can be very important for people. Mm -hmm. uh, that we identify ourselves like that or that, you know, they're the sports dude or they're the, you know, computer geek or mm -hmm. they're the whatever. Um, uh, if they get into, like, games of, like, mm -hmm. like Magic the Gathering, you know, it's them. This is who yeah. they are. And for existentialism, one big theme. Now, so... There are different existentialists, and so I'll just be clear, you know, so for one of the bigger existentialists, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre, mm -hmm. uh, 
for him, none of these things, there is no definition of the person. Hmm. One can talk about a self, but the self basically has no content because it's just you're saying, you can imagine yourself in different circumstances. Well, for Sartre, there is no, there's nothing that inherently defines what we are because, well, certainly you can imagine yourself in different kind of circumstances, but this is actually what separates us from other things. So things are rigid. Uh, so think of like a book or a coat or even a, a, like a career or like a job. There are certain kind of definitions that go along with them. And then if something is what it is, so you, know, so you have an umbrella, that umbrella is an umbrella because it fits a definition, mm -hmm. right? And the umbrella can do nothing else but be what it's made for. Mm -hmm. Now, people can use it for different kinds of things, but then people are reconstructing its definition too. Mm -hmm. um, like, like my sons will use umbrellas as swords, right? Yeah. But then what they're doing is they're defining this instrument then as a sword. But the problem with things is they can do nothing but be what they are made to do. Mm -hmm. They can't change. So for Sartre, and so so for Sartre with that, like so an umbrella, an umbrella has an essence. It, it is something. It, it is what it's made to do. Mm -hmm. For humans, Sartre's like, that's not the case at all. Mm -hmm. We're not defined by anything. Uh, what we do is we define ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's no blueprint by, by which we must follow. Uh, we can question ourselves, we can change things, even though it may be really hard, but what makes us very different from anything else, you know, that anything that lacks self-consciousness, what makes us unique is that we make ourselves in the process. And so through our history, we're creating who we are, not that our past will ever then necessarily determine what we'll be doing in the future. Mm -hmm. So our future is for him. And, and so people have balked you know, at existentialism for these kind of points for good reasons, because there is something about causality and determinism you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, in many ways, psych and Soch, they're really good at mapping what humans will do. Mm -hmm. But for Sartre, you know, our future is genuinely open. Mm -hmm. we, we can change, even though it may be hard at times, you know, especially if people have addictions or certain kind of personality traits but that we can actually change. And so this is, you know, one of the kernels then for Sartre. There is no such thing as human nature. There is something of what it's like to be a human. I mean, obviously we have, you know, we're embodied, you know, we're embodied, which is funny to say, um, is there a way to not be embodied? But we have bodies, right? And we have language and we use language and we live in societies and stuff like that. So there's a, a human condition, mm -hmm. which we can talk about, but there's no nature to humanity for Sartre that we have to follow it. And certainly not for the individual. The individual can always change things. Um, and, you know, so, and like another prong for that is that what is meaningful at all ever is only always what one takes to be meaningful. Hmm. One cannot be scripted, think something's meaningful. One always has to then somehow agree that's meaningful. Um, so like, you know, our currency system, it only has meaning because that's what we give it. Yeah. Um, but anything else anyway, you know, you're throwing air at me, mm -hmm. right? You, you're doing something in your throat, you're manipulating the air and you get the sound waves and it hits my ear. Well, I have to then choose, and even unconsciously in this, in this kind of instance, to take those, you know, I'll call them utterances and then words. I take them as meaningful, but I need not do that. I mean, it's in some ways you, know, you can not take things to be meaningful, uh, you know, like diamond ring, right? Mm. You think, oh, of course, it's really expensive and valuable. Mm. But it's, the only value that it has for me is that value by which I give it. Yeah. And if I give it no value, it has no value. If the, if the words you're speaking have no value, if I deem them as, you know, not mm. valued, well, then I'm not going to value them. And so the source of all meaning comes from the person. But then how one takes or what one will take as meaningful is not scripted ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like with your perception uh, with starters that it's almost like comes across as optimistic to me. Like there's a lot of potential there. 
Yeah, well, it's yeah. funny you say that because a lot of people take existentialism as a very downward. yeah, and that's why I find it ironic. It's because I usually hear people talking ex about existentialism from a very um, negative, like crisis kind of viewpoint. On like, I don't know who I am. I don't know what my meaning is, and they don't know how to find meaning for someone that is legitimately having an existential crisis. Or they might have a perception of reality that they don't like, but they don't know how to get out of that. Yes, it's very scary. Mm -hmm. uh, existential crises. Uh, it's, I, yeah, you know, so I don't know a formal definition of what that would be, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of times it's questioning the meaning of things. Yeah. Uh, you don't know which direction to go. You don't know really what's up or down. And it can be quite scary. Mm -hmm. um, I think these moments, um, existential crises or existential moments, mm -hmm are one of the best in the world, even though a lot of times it's really painful and tragic to go through some of these. Yeah. Uh, like especially, you know, so if, if someone you love dies, mm -hmm. say a mom or dad or, or whoever, it's really painful. Yeah. But then you get this really deep self-reflective process. And a lot of times these incidents or these events, they ratchet you out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. And so you're in this kind of, yeah. You know, so using in this, in this term, you're in this extraordinary kind of state. Yeah. And it's, it's tragic, but yet great. Mm -hmm. It's just wonderful to go through those kinds of things. Hindsight, you know, so not you know, why you're doing it. But then, yeah, you're, you're figuring stuff out. Um, you, usually it's, you're, you're deepening yourself a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, hopefully it sticks. A lot of times people then go right back into whatever. Yeah. But hopefully it makes you a little bit deeper. Um, yeah, so I like these kind of, these moments. Yeah, and I think that they are, they're more exciting than they are scary to me personally. I know I definitely That's going to be a personality thing. Yeah, I, I think it really does have to do with personality. Like, I've seen people that have a view on life, and they tell me that they just hate reality. And I'll talk with them <laughs> and say, like, how do we get to this point? Like, how, like, why do you believe this way? I'm like, I don't believe this way. This is just how my body reacts to everything. And I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? I'm like, I don't know what I mean by that. I'm like, well, how do you know you're at this point? Because I know I feel it. I'm like, well, okay, um, let's... Let's start thinking about this more, about like why this might be the case. Or someone also that is always happy. It's like a versionary, someone that's always happy and always has a positive perception on things. And even when times go wrong, they'll still experience bad emotions and whatnot. Like they're like all powerful and can like not be sad or down or depressed. But it's that they have a different way of finding meaning from things. And I think that your views like from existential thought points can really change someone's personality and and even the confusing thing that still is to me is like the old Max Sartre about how there's nothing that's inherently part of our nature maybe I'm just confused but I'm not sure if you're referring to like an individual level or just humans as a whole like if someone will say like oh yeah like Chris you're you're a very upbeat kind of guy you're that's just how you are and is that something that's like a result of you growing up is that just or is that like inherently part of your personality like in where to go to like other multiverses and meet other Chris's where yeah. the majority of them be like a similar personality to you, even if you're in a completely different part of life or like in a different major, like you could be a businessman, but like still the same personality. So, well, if someone makes a, a comment, you know, so, Oh, Hey, you know, you know, Ken, you're, you're a really upbeat guy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's who you are. Yeah. Those determinations are based upon your past. Mm. And so there's patterns that it, we do create mm -hmm. um, for Sartre that's in the realm of being our so our past is now set it's stone it, you know it's done mm -hmm. and so it is something so it is which you know so to understand what that is you know, the, you know it's something and so one can see the patterns but for Sartre the humanity you know the no not the humanity uh, the human so so for me mm -hmm. in my moment of self-consciousness I'm not anything. My past is something. Mm -hmm. So it's an is. But my present moment is an is not. There's nothing that I am. So one could say, Chris, you are a beat. Well, my past is. But it does not mean that that will continue. It can change. Mm -hmm. uh, so it starts very clear. You know, there's, you know, um, and also, you know, um, Ortega y Gossett um, was very good on this point mm -hmm. and saying, you know, we're, we're, we're humans are weird creatures. Mm -hmm. We're like um, 
and there's a term, I forget who gave this term, like ontological centaurs. Ont on ontology is like reality centaurs. You know, you, the upper half is a person and the bottom half is a horse. Um, so humans are like ontological centaurs. So you have one foot in the waters of being. Because certainly we are something, certainly like our past. But then we're one foot out of the waters of being. Like, mm -hmm. like we're non-being. You know, so it's like we are something and we're not something, which is very Sartrean. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ortega y Cossett came before Sartre, and I actually think that maybe Sartre lifted some of this from from him. But yeah, we're we're we're, we're definitely weird creatures, and so I think you know our past has bearing on us, and I, I think you can say our past certainly has influence. Mm -hmm. But for Sartre, and he was criticized as maybe being too stark on this, is that our past does not determine. Our future whatsoever our, or you know or our present yeah so. and that's the thing too that um i hear a lot of people describe in much more heuristic kind of ways what we describe by saying things as the sky's the limit it's essentially saying that what happened in the past is the past but um right now with yourself things can always change for the in this case the better and i think that's really interesting too and, and it's kind of why I go why i describe as optimistic because let's say if it's something that's good, all you have to do is make sure you try to maintain that goodness feeling like that. Because um, like something like happiness is fleeting, as we know. So you have to just do maintenance of someone that's their life might be down or things like that. Hmm. You have to try to find meaning or try to um, fix that. And it's one of those things where someone might think in a way of I had a rough childhood, like I had like maybe abusive parents. So therefore, I'm always going to be angry for the rest of life my life and while they might be more prone to being angry and this might be more psychology honestly it, it's it's something where um i don't want to be like the overly optimist and say you can be happy or you can overcome this because maybe they can't but at the same time I, I always feel like there might just be something there that can help at least cope with this or start making changes that we just don't know yet and so i think that's why this type of thinking I can definitely agree with and why it makes me optimistic is because it's something where when I look at my a lot of my own meaning or things I just might be confused on or things I don't care about my traits I feel like it's something that I can change about myself or I can see others change about themselves in a way that's either I'm going to make them happier or be able to maintain like that meaning and happiness with their lives yeah it sounds like you're to more of um, existential psychology, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of existentialism wouldn't they wouldn't say um, you know one should be optimistic or yeah. there's a path to be more optimistic. It's from the existentialists that I'm more aware of in this kind of capacity. It's more about yeah. how do you find meaning or no, sorry, not even how to find meaning, um, but what is where does meaning generate from. Mm. And then understanding what's going on. So it's back to the, the definition I gave before is a phenomenological study. It's understanding our experience and what's going on there. And that meaning is generated from self-consciousness mm -hmm. and you know the value that one gives it. A lot of people think that existentialism is really dour and dark because a lot of existentialists talk about death. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, that we're going to die. You know, yeah. so it's not really a you know, <laughs> spoiler alert, um, it's, you know, we all know it, mm -hmm. but that a lot of people will try to postpone thinking about it, uh, yeah. try to think, well, mm, but but not me yet, right? It's always something off into the future. It's always a distant thing, but always a far distant thing. Obviously, when you get older, you think it's maybe not as distant, but it's still something that's removed. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of existentialists want, and especially something that Martin Heidegger talked about, is that death should be something that is present to you mm -hmm. because uh, death is something that is with you already mm -hmm. because to be human, you know, the human condition, because of the self-consciousness, it's always an awareness that one is going to die. And what one should do is embrace that. Mm -hmm. It's not a sour thing or a dark thing. Is that you embrace it. And then once you really know it, then what you do, you, know, you don't escape from it. Mm -hmm. you, you embrace it. But then know, you know, well, now live, mm -hmm. right? To understand one's own death is one of the kernels to understand well, now it's time to live. Yeah. Because this will not last forever. 
um, there's a quote I saw on, you know, so one of these memes mm -hmm. that goes around, um, you know, love fiercely mm -hmm. because this all ends. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's very existentialist. It's, mm -hmm. it's live now. I want to say like carpe diem, you know, seize the day. I mean, it kind of bleed into these kinds of deals. Yeah. But in that way, it's optimistic yeah. or that way it's, you know, to live. Um, Camus, um, Albert Camus um, is considered to be frequently in anthologies on existentialism. He's considered to be an existentialist, though he himself rejected the title. Uh, but for him, it was, you know, not necessarily, had, you know, for him, it was to live. And it's not necessarily about the quality of the experiences, but the quantity. Like, just go, just go out and do everything, you mm -hmm. know, to do it and to really live. I, I would say, you know, maybe the quality of experiences matters to some extent. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're just, you know, trying meth all the time, well, that's going to suck for you. But just to do a lot of things. And so it can be optimistic. It's not supposed to be dark. Uh, Sartre, he had to fight against this because uh, the common conception was, you know, the existentialists wore all black clothes and, you know, yeah. it was very, you know, brooding and stuff. But it doesn't have to be that way. It can mm -hmm. be very, um, I would say like a life-affirming kind of philosophy, mm -hmm. even though, you know, th there's maybe some embracing the darkness in some mm -hmm. ways, embracing uh different aspects of humanity um or so yeah so yeah i agree yeah. it can be very dark but it's supposed to be an uplifting kind of thing i think in the end but more so where does meaning come from and we're in control of our own lives you know yeah. and so like we take responsibility we should take responsibility for our own selves you know pawn the blame off you know shift the blame off and to really start living mm -hmm. and with that too i'll make a few more comments too but um, I think we could dive that into free will um, as well, too, about like or your thoughts on that area as well, too, and how it can relate to existentialism. But I agree. It's that I view existentialism from a very positive point. Like my view on death is that like I don't want to die anytime soon. And practically, I don't think I will. But at the same time, if I do. But it could happen at any yeah, moment. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like I could go home right now and get in a car crash and die. But or just have a heart attack. Hopefully not in here because that'd be really awkward. Yes, yeah, so um, that would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's um, it's one of those things where I always live my life. Or as joking as be YOLO or or carpe diem. YOLO. That's yeah. a, like the most simplistic way, I guess you could put this whole philosophy. But it, it's really an idea of um, living your life to the fullest too. So while there might be things like I might do extra activities that really can bring me to myself and other activities I think would um, be exciting but would be dangerous like I could start smoking but that would bring off years of my life and I might get like enjoyment I guess from some of it but it's just something that could be dangerous to me but other things too um, like going on roller coasters or something like that it's like <laughs> hey it's like I can make excuses like oh I'm busy today I need to do something and then like you know what I get enjoyment out of this. I love fun. And to me, maybe um, the meaning of life is to just really enjoy myself as much as I'm allowed to. So it's um, that's like a, um, a view that I might have. So I think it's very interesting about how people make of their lives based off these existential thoughts, and especially how they approach death. Because it, so many people I know have completely different views of death and how reactly some people think that well, nothing after death, so I'm not scared if I die, but I do want to live longer. Some people might think that, you know what, I might go up to heaven right after I die. And so I will still live a life to my fullest, but I'm not too concerned for after I die because it's like nothing's going to change for me. Hmm. Um, so there's so many different ways that people can perceive that. And I think that the after effects of life is a very big way to determine how people might perceive their current meaning in this life. Yeah, uh, to go back to you're talking about roller coasters, roller roller coasters and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You know, for one to, I say to be an existentialist. I guess that's uh, an odd way of putting it. I mean, existentialism is a is a philosophical way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think one can have aspects of ex existentialism in them, whether or not they call themselves an existentialist or not. I, yeah. I guess whatever, but um, you know. One doesn't have to do anything different than what one is already doing. You know, say, let's say someone's taking a nine, you know, doing a nine to five job, you know, all the time, and it seems mundane, and then one hits existentialism. 
mm -hmm. somehow and studies it and, and reads up on it and really embraces you know, what's going on. One does not have to live one's life any differently mm -hmm. um, in a manner of speaking because uh, existentialism is, is a way of viewing life. It's like changing the inside. Yeah. And so from the outside, it could seem like one's doing the same thing all the time. But on the inside, life could take, take a very different color. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it could look very, very different for the person. Uh, that the job that seemed mundane can now, it doesn't have to be this way, but it can now be full of meaning that the person didn't see before. Because the one can then generate the meaning, you know, see different kinds of things. Or just be in wonder at, you know, all that's going on with the job one's doing. Mm -hmm. But one re-enters the world in a different kind of way if yeah. one's like embracing it. So I think that's what existentialists want to happen. There is an aspect of maybe one does change one's life a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that if one is hyper materialistic, embracing existentialism to you know certain existentialist themes to an extent should make one less so because mm -hmm. you know being materialistic tends to also, you know, your identity is wrapped up in that. But then if you realize you really aren't any of those things, then, well, then you probably aren't going to be nearly as materialistic. Yeah. But you can still enjoy these things and still do all these things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have to live life to the fullest as, you know, what Camus was saying. But it, it, so, but it can. But first and foremost, it's a changing of the inner person. Yeah. And then it may, it may manifest itself out in other ways. Yeah, I agree completely, too. And... Yeah, it's like it's people can like people have had existential crises I knew and they change their life. Um, I always hope that'll change them for the better. Sometimes it won't, and that's why it's almost like one of those timing things too. If someone has an existential crisis, maybe at a very low point in their life, it could be a different effect than someone that had at a really high point, or just someone's natural moods, or like let's say they have depression or not, could really affect their reaction to these t types of thoughts and thinking. So it can be very varied between people. But I think, too, that this is a great way to segue into the idea of free will. Um, you want to talk about that? <laughs> if, you, if you really would rather not, we can just... Well, no, it's, it's a big topic. Yeah. Uh, so Sartre's existentialism, uh, yeah. because humans are nothing, mm -hmm. um, in terms of we're not things, so there's no definition. For him, that does mean we have radical free will. Okay. And... Uh, which also then the further further implication is then that we have radical responsibility. Okay. But yeah, we do have radical free will. Then nothing determines us. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about causality in all manners of speaking. But for the human, the self conscious human, it's a matter of what we decide to do, and that there is no determining reason for why we do what we do, except that that's just what we choose to do. So um. And people balk at that because uh, it seems pretty clear that there there are causes for what we do. Mm -hmm. So from an inside perspective, from the existential perspective, you know, I choose what I want to do. I'm choosing it. Uh, no one's really choosing it for me. Um, I could reject. You know, someone's even like trying to make me do something. I can like, and there's always options, but which I can do something different than what's being intended for me. Uh, so from the inside point of view, it's, it seems like, oh yeah, it seems like we have this kind of free will. And we talk about free will. I mean, this is very popular in America, you know, mm -hmm. freedom, right? But from an outside perspective, so more of a scientific perspective, scientific perspective, looking at the human as an object, as a thing, oh, come on, it's like hard to deny. I mean, there are you know, economics and uh, psych and social um, anthropology. I mean, there's very clear ways it seems like humans interact. Mm -hmm. um, or else, you know, ec economic models wouldn't work very well. But they do. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they're predictive models. And so we don't have a grasp on all the, the causal variables operative. But the models work. Mm -hmm. And so in science, you know, science is, is great. You know, it's the science is great is in mapping the physical world, natural world. But we're also physical beings. And so a lot of science, you know, so that's why we have the social sciences. And they're really great at mapping humanity uh i mean i could even you know do a you know do probably a like psychological analysis of myself to like you know well, what are the things i'll be thinking later on or why i'm thinking the way i'm thinking and there's usually there's some cause you know very clear causal reasons for it and so it seems like 
we, well, we don't really have free will. Free will in the existentialist sense. There's different conceptions of free will. Uh, but the way of free will that people want is really this, I can do what I want. Mm -hmm. I am the ultimate determiner of my own fate. Um, and that, you know, I'm not, there's nothing scripted for me. But then it seems like, so it's a really good, it's a really good, I don't know, playing on each other. It seems like we have free will, but then from an inside perspective, but then from the outside perspective, it seems like, yeah. how can there be any room for it at all? Yeah. And that is that now I should clarify kind of what I was gearing more towards like the existentialism um, with free will coupling. Um, because I know you could question things about like, well, our bodies are limited and our bodies are uh, finite and tangible. So therefore true free will doesn't exist. And that might be a conversation for another time, but more into the idea of we have like abilities, we have bodies that are capable of doing things and thinking. So therefore, what kind of free will do we have from what we're given? Like that kind of free will. And that might be more determined to even by the types of locations we live in too. Like I think that um, living here in Wisconsin, um, we might have a lot of choice for free will just because we have like more economic op options, more understanding of things in education or we could go down a completely different path about like um, just what we're able to do or what we're capable of um, with the free will that we might be presented, even if we don't see it, or if we see it or not. Yeah. So for start, this is a black and white issue for humans. Every human has every, so every self-conscious human, mm -hmm. you know, so there can be, you know, you can say you're human, but the person's like unconscious or, yeah. you know, in a vegetative state, but every, Self-conscious human has free will. Uh, he even says, you know, one's condemned to freedom because one can't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's just, yes, you've got it. There's no degree. So it's n no gradient. Now, the free will that it seems like you're talking about is more of, so especially when you say something like uh, different economic resources for different places that you live in, there, the second sense of free will is called compatibilism. Is that, you know, to be free is to act according to one's own beliefs and desires mm -hmm. um, without any immediate external coercion. So if one's able to do what one wants without extra kind of pressures, you know, impinging upon the situation, then we consider the person free. Um, if person, if, if a, you know, a person is, you know, born into extremely you know, poor circumstances and so extreme poverty, uh, you know, can the person buy, you know, a Ferrari? No, the person's not free to do so um, because the external circumstances are then impinging upon the person. Mm -hmm. uh, Sartre would say, well, yes, yeah, the person is free to do it. You know, maybe the person doesn't have the resources at the moment yet. But for existentialism, it's uh, for compatibilism. It's all based upon the external circumstances that you find yourself in. One's environment will determine whether or not what you're doing is free. Uh, you know, if you if there's a gun pointed to your head, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I give this example in an in intro. If someone has a gun pointed to your head, you know, telling you to, you know, rob the bank teller in front of you, well, in a court of law, you know, if you follow the instructions of what the the, the, gun, the gunman's saying, uh, you would not be held responsible because you didn't have the free will at that moment. Well, why? Because you had this gun pointing to your head. So you don't have free freedom that way. Mm -hmm. um, for the existentialist, the existentialist would say, you know, you still have free, to, you still have free will mm -hmm. because you can choose not to. But in a very practical sense, we think of free will in terms of, in that way as no, and no legal system, you know, no legal system would ever say, you know, would, would, would convict you for theft in those kind of circumstances. Mm -hmm. But, the compatibilist understanding of free will is compatible with determinism. This is why it's called compatibilism, is that free will and determinism can go together, but it's a, re it's a reconfiguring of what free will means. Existentialists would not agree with that. They say, that's not deep enough. That for the human, we have a deeper sense of freedom than just what our external circumstances can dictate for us. Uh, that we have this freedom by which no matter what our circumstances, no matter what, we could, we, we're, we are self-caused beings. So we cause ourselves to do what we do. Nothing from the outside. Hmm. So 
it's a nice little interplay. I mean, this is a very, I find this debate very, very interesting because determinism seems to have a big purchase upon our lives because we are physical beings and, you know, like food and, and medications affect us a lot, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's very clear they do things to us. Uh, but so that's from a physical analysis. Mm -hmm. But then from an existential analysis, we have a different kind of thing. This is why I feel like, uh, I, I almost feel like we've not, I want to have some sort of unified view of the human. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe this is a flaw for, for my own, and I guess I should wonder why do I want that. But I feel like maybe we don't have the right kind of categories to really understand humanity very well. Mm -hmm. You can have a phenomenological understanding, you know, this is ex existentialism. And then you can have like a scientific understanding by which humans are more like objects or things. And they both have value, but, but they are not consistent with each other. Uh, it's you it's very different points of view maybe that's an okay thing maybe it's the mosaic of understanding humanity mm -hmm. but maybe we don't have the right categories yet to really understand ourselves in the best kind of way it bothers me we talk about personal identity all the time but yet when you try to figure out well, what is the i you know the capital i me mm -hmm. i have no clue we use it you know effortlessly you know as the first person pronoun but actually concretizing it you know really getting the definition of it seems so it's like water through hands it just it's elusive so maybe we shouldn't have the right categories to really understand ourselves so i mean this is where i am in some of my research and stuff like that on consciousness of just trying to figure this stuff out and i don't know i mean it's um you know the the contemporary mindset you know the contemporary philosophical mindset we have certain ways of understanding humanity um philosophers in the past have had different other kinds of ways of thinking about humanity and so maybe i don't know if there's a progression or just different kind of modes but maybe or paradigms as, mm. as you know, thomas kuhn would say in science i guess but maybe we need a paradigm shift of even understanding ourselves i don't know yeah i think that would definitely be an interesting thing to learn more about if we could because yeah it's like every time much of the issues of free will that addresses others is just the difference of how we view free will, especially um, when it comes to our existential thoughts of what we're capable of. And it can be very frustrating for me too at times when I try to express how I view things or how I might naturally gravitate towards certain life meaning, but I cannot express those to other humans <laughs> around me. And just, I, I, I don't, I, I can't put into words and over time, with once again uh, philosophical, philosophical thinking, I can better express those ideas and those meanings. But it's something where, yeah, it's there's so many different things that will gravitate into one another, but it's not really consistent, like you're saying. And it's really, it can be hard to communicate certain things with certain people on um, those areas. So I mean, that's just been my experiences. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um. But I'd like to jump more into with how people perceive these things, especially like we talked a little bit about the history of it, unless there's some other notable philosophers that contributed to existentialism that you want to talk about. Well, the father of existentialism is um, considered to be, uh, <laughs> depends on how you want to say the name, uh, but Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard. Um, I guess pe people may... Uh, uh, hear it more likely as Kierkegaard. Yeah, I've always heard of Kierkegaard. Uh, I didn't know there's yeah, a pronunciation. Yeah. Um, and Cartwright, David Cartwright and I, we kind of bicker about what's <laughs> the right way of saying it. Uh, yeah, Kierkegaard, uh, he was reacting against um, one of the big philosophers of the day. So this mm -hmm. middle 1800s. Uh, Hegel uh, was huge in Germany. And so, and, and back then everyone, everyone was a Hegelian. But um, Hegel really, you know, the individual had very little value in his system. Mm -hmm. The individual, the individual was just like a grain, mm -hmm. and didn't really matter. And Kierkegaard <laughs> really upset him, and so, you know, he championed the, you know, the value of the individual and what that means. And so, a lot of people credit Kierkegaard as, you know, that's that's where existentialism really started in that kind of way of understanding the experience, because also very big with subjectivity and but like a big inwardness. And so that's where it started. Now, uh, but he was very, uh, Kierkegaard was very Christian. So he was very, he was very theological in a lot of his philosophy. 
uh, but you can detach the philosophical from the theological. And that's what a lot of later existentialists did, is they, you know, you know, dissected out the theological and kept the, the, you know, the more philosophical parts, and you know, those were considered, I guess, you know, more existentialism, uh, and further them. Uh, most existentialists after Kierkegaard uh, were not theistic. Um, a lot of them kind of thought, you know, in fact, even Sartre was very clear about this. You know, that you know, if God exists, then you know, we have no free will, and existentialism is dead. Um, and so, for him. Because if God exists, and God knows who we are before we're created, and God can see everything that's going to happen in my life, well, then how am I not then a thing? Mm -hmm. Because then my essence is already created, and I can only do what I'm scripted to do. Just like you know, I give the early example of an umbrella. That would be nothing like I mean, it'd be nothing you know different than an umbrella. I mean, I wouldn't be sheltering people from rain, <laughs> but I I couldn't diverge from the blueprint set for me. And so a lot of existentialists after Kierkegaard did happen to be um, atheistic, though there were still some theistic existentialists um, that, 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 that popped up. Mm -hmm. But you know, existentialism uh, is not so popular these days because you know, with the advent of, no, I don't say, well, probably with postmodernism, um, but this more that the social dimension to human experience has become much more um, understood, known, um, talked about. It's become a more of a salient, salient category. And so, since existentialism was so rooted in the individual, but then, you know, so Sartre's writing in the um, 1930s and 40s, you know, and 50s, but then starting in like, you know, later 50s and 60s and 70s social dimensions were much more popular to talk about, and so existentialism kind of went to the wayside. Uh, so I find it to be an instructive philosophy to think about, but it needs to be in tandem with under, you know, with knowing, you know, there's social dimensions to who we are. Language itself is social. You know, there, there's no such thing as having a your own private language without already implicating and, you know, leaning upon society. Mm -hmm. uh, but the existentialist themes I think are still important, you know, so that of where does meaning come from? Now, meaning, you know, can be, can come from many different sources, but, you know, there's a value in understanding the individual's role in this and that we do have a subjectivity. I mean, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, it's hard to think about the world. Like you can't think of the world other than through Ken's eyes. I mean, there's no mm -hmm. other world for you than that. Yeah. And that's where existentialism starts is that the phenomenological analysis still has purchase and understanding ourselves, even though, you know, there's social things to think about and, you know, in, in those kinds of ways. Um, existentialism is valuable in uh, deepening one's self-reflective capabilities. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, understanding what that means um, to be, you know, identity, understand well, who one is and maybe what one's not, mm -hmm. right? So Sartre has this whole analysis of consciousness is that, you know, that really at the heart of being or the heart of the human is this pit of nothingness mm -hmm. because we're not anything. Because whenever you think about something, well, you know, that's not what you are. Like, I'm like looking at a candy dish right now. Well, I'm not that. And mm -hmm. I'm looking at your, you know, your, your lip balm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not that, nor am I you. And so there's thinking requires a whole bunch of negations. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really nothing. And so, but that's instructive to think about. And so I, I, I like thinking about all that. Um, and I didn't even mention, you know, I mentioned briefly Camus um, uh, to some extent um, earlier, but you know, Camus, um, he's instructive. You know, so he's his philosophy was really of the absurd. Uh, what he marveled at is that when you look out into the universe, it really seems evident that. The universe doesn't care a squat about us. Mm -hmm. The universe is really indifferent to our existence or not, right? That meaningless meaninglessness dominates, but yet we cannot help but give meaning to things. Mm -hmm. And so you have this paradox, paradoxical, paradoxical situation by which we live in a meaningless universe in which we cannot help but give meaning. Yeah. And so that's where humanity lies. And this is in this paradoxical state. I think that's instructive. 
Um, I think that's it's an interesting kind of way of looking at reality, looking at the world. Um, whether or not one buys it or not, you know, I'll go back to the, our first part of the, the podcast. Um, it's up to them. Yeah. Uh, you know, they can see this perspective. It's an interesting, interesting perspective. And then they can kind of uh, use it to figure out what they think. And so yeah. it can make one more interesting in that kind of way. Yeah. And I think so, too. It's I, I like and I think this does like go full circle, too, with the idea of the absurdity with things. And I, I think that there is a bias with that. The people I don't think or like haven't been exposed to like any real or significant level of philosophical thinking to think that all these thoughts are meaningless and so therefore it's not useful but um i think that even um like because i've expressed how i think it's practical but even with this absurd kind of thinking things that might never affect me um but it's something that it's really interesting to think about especially with like finding meaning of life and how you'll hear people express like what qualifies for meaning and what doesn't qualify for that meaning too or and i'm sure that you could find a way to decon like to like essentially attack someone about their claim meaning of life and find a way to make it like unmeaningful <laughs> and like i mean not like anyone would want to do that but i mean if someone said like oh well it's not mean like what matters we're gonna die anyways and we'll be forgot about in like a hundred years like everyone will be forgot about in a hundred years so, um, but then you can say, that, like, let's say you did something more significant. You're like the hero of the galaxy or something like that. And, well, then I can say, well, then in a thousand years, no one will re remember you. So why why would anyone care? You could always find a way to deconstruct someone's meaning yeah, of so it can, life. It can be a, a real buzzkill, right, to yeah. do that. <laughs> um, and when that one does or not, I guess it's up to them. Uh, yeah. I, I, I do think sometimes, and so I wrestle with, how far do you push some people? Yeah. Uh, like if you feel like their viewpoint is really wrong, mm -hmm. but they really find happiness in it. Mm -hmm. And let's say they're not hurting others in the process because mm -hmm. th that would be a different dimension. Is there harm in allowing it to persist? Or is there, mm -hmm. is there is, are you actually doing harm by going through the questioning? This is something which I, it's, well, I wonder about it mm -hmm. and so um and i think it's it's not something i know how to solve quite yet but, but it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis i think for some people if they're caught in beliefs by which they really are harm, harmful for them mm -hmm. or or and or harmful mm -hmm. for others that they're interacting with well i think yeah one should probably you know really question things being open to being questioned oneself right yeah. it shouldn't ever be a one-way street but uh one should uh yeah, figure that out. Well, well since yeah. it got really quiet in here for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I agree completely, too. It is really hard to know where that fine line is for, like, how to, how to um, like, essentially be poking at someone to try to find meaning of their meaning, too. Like, if someone finds meaning in going home every night and just watching TV and then going to the 9-to-5 job, then uh, to me that's like that's not meaningful at all how can you appreciate life like that and you're like oh well i appreciate life I'm, but then i'm thinking like i'm not convinced you do i think you're just unaware of how happy or how much mean of life you could really get if you thought about it but then if they're really resisting that i mean it's where's where's my choice i mean there's obvious things like if someone says i like someone that's like a really obvious case, like a serial killer, that's not good because they're bringing <laughs> tremendous harm to others. So you can easily disqualify that. But someone that if they're um, eating a lot, if they're smoking, if they're not doing anything, they don't have a social life or they, they do a job that you find to be kind of pointless, then it's something that it really gets hard to really talk about that. And then when they inquire, like, why, why isn't this meaningful? It's meaningful to me. It's hard to really rebuttal that you can give like all your reasons you think like how much could be better but if that's their meaning of life and they're perfectly happy with that that's a really hard thing to counterpoint yeah i i think it's tricky in terms of making judgments on others mm -hmm. i mean i think a lot of ways i mean if people are i mean mm -hmm. we're gonna die anyway right yeah um i guess you know some practices might make one die sooner rather than later but if that's the person's choice to do, yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, this is getting into ethics and stuff like that. Yeah. But I, I, th I would be, I would caution on the 
judging on some kind of categories mm -hmm. and but that's why the conversation is great yeah um it's more of just in, entering in the conversation talking about things uh mm -hmm. and you can give reasons for why you believe what you believe and they can give reasons for why they believe what they believe mm -hmm. and you can go on from there yeah i think that's what makes this, this stuff super interesting is because it's not so straightforward especially like we won't go into about ethics that's not straightforward stuff it's no it takes a lot of thinking something like math while it's basically just a concept like math itself isn't a thing that exists but we tested it and we know it works i mean it's like calculus were worked before calculus existed we just weren't aware of it as a concept we created the concept it could be called anything else but as long as the function and the symbology linguistics all that stuff was the same it still work but with some of these things with like meaning and ethics they're not so obvious um there isn't things like two plus two equals four in ethics at times and there might be things that are more obvious like murder is bad on most occasions but um other things too of someone saying like you can't measure someone saying that i love drinking but it might shave off two years of my life but i had a blast like i i love my 20s and 30s someone might argue and it's like you can't really measure that and say like well this you have to have x amount of fun for it to be worth this um in the end and that's just something that's really hard to really test <laughs> yeah and it will depend upon which you know so for ethics what ethical theory you adhere to yeah uh, different ethical theories it may be more mathematic like um certainly kantian ethics it's you know there's blacks and whites mm -hmm. um like you, sh you should never lie it's mm -hmm. black and white um but there's many ethical theories right. and, and a lot of times and this is why i think ethics is, is this is why i don't like doing ethics i mean i consider myself an ethical person but not because mm -hmm. it's just so messy yeah and so to do ethical theory and to say oh this is my ethical theory you know i think in practice you know we're all ethical mutts mm -hmm. we, we we draw from many different kind of intuitions and reasons i think decisions should always, always be based on reasons mm -hmm. but i think we'll have different kinds of values and ethical mores that kind of factor into these things and and i'm not sure we'll always know which things will crop up in the moment mm -hmm. when we're trying to make our decisions yeah so my last question on this topic since we're getting pretty close to the two-hour mark here is and this one I, I don't know if you observe or not but we like going back into just let's say modern america or it could be wisconsin it could be america or the united states it could be even just the western world do you notice any trends with the way people nowadays discuss existentialism or how it's people that might not be like involved with uh, philosophical studies just like everyday people using everyday language how they tend to engage with existentialism and like do you ever notice any trends with that is there maybe trends different between different generations of people or ways influenced just by our lives like like i know that's a big question like is, is something where you just know differences about how it changes over time with the way people engage with these topics well in terms of existentialism proper um you know it's it's not it's not even taught often in the university i mean i teach it here at, at uw whitewater but there are other institutions that don't even offer it um mm. so existentialism has you know as its own formal kind of scope has is not as popular as it once was okay the but i i like teaching because i think it has value in in self-reflective thinking uh i yeah but so existential themes you know do people consider them uh you know, I may I may be the wrong person to ask because, like, when I teach the course, um, and then when I'm teaching other philosophic or philosophy courses, you know, philosophy here is not required at Whitewater, and so there's a self-selection process, and so I tend to get more people interested in these kinds of things. Maybe not necessarily existentialism, but I think I have a disproportionate number of people who are already interested in this these kinds of things in my classes, well, certainly with existentialism, I would think, mm -hmm. than just the, the the regular, you know, the person on the street. Yeah. But I think, you know, different walks of life, uh, you'll have different kinds of people. Yeah. Uh, young, uh, middle, and then old, you know, I think people who are older, 
generally are more result, you know, self-reflective about you know impending death and things like that. But it doesn't mean that people in the other categories aren't. Uh, but I mean, I've not say necessarily noticed. It's more of a personality thing. I think there are um, something I've learned. There are some people who are definitely more prone to like philosophical thinking and to they're okay in questioning their beliefs a little bit more um, or just have the interest in the kind of topics. Um, philosophy is certainly a practice, but it has its own content. Um, you know, so you know, we talk about free will and determinism, so meaning of life, um, you know, existence of God. And I know there's theological understandings of that, but the philosophical way of thinking about God, you know, are there arguments, you know, that whether you're an atheist or theist, you can accept, you know, you know, is there a way to convince you know the other side that they're right or wrong? Uh, so philosophy does have its own content, and different people have different personalities. Mm -hmm. Some people just could care less uh, about. Like I get really into thinking about uh, the concepts of time and space, and many people just don't care. Yeah, and that's fine. I mean, it's, they don't have to care. Uh, I mean, and people don't even have to care about meaning of life necessarily. It's, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I have my life to live and they have their lives to live. And, um, you know, let the chips fall where they may. And you know, so, so I'm not sure I've noticed that there's more people interested in philosophy now, you know, in a general thing than, than before. Uh, I don't even know if, I mean, I generally think that America is probably not, there's plenty of room for people to think better. So do I want philosophy to gain traction? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that'll be great. Uh, but is it going to happen? I don't know. But I can do my own little bit and teach my own philosophy courses here and, and hopefully help some people out and think them better. But yeah, it's, it's hard for me. It's, it's, a, it's a big question I'm, yeah. and I don't really know. Well, yeah, I'm sure that there's probably some Pew studies out there or something like that that show people interested in certain areas. But yeah, we'll find out. We'll just have to find out later. But regardless, I still think that there will always be people interested in this stuff. And I agree. It's I think there is certain personalities or just certain kinds of people that are more inclined to care about these things. And it's probably why there's um, sometimes negative uh, stereotypes of philosophies just by the people that will say, I simply don't care. Um, but I think that's still something that's very valuable. And... I think that maybe for the areas for the people that even want to take extra classes and stuff like that, so the people that are just more naturally inclined to wonder about the things that might not affect our immediate lives. Yes. Um, so it's always very interesting, though. But thank you very much, Chris. It's been a pleasure having you on the show today. This was a very exciting conversation. I got a lot out of this. Uh, I really appreciated this, Ken. Thanks for asking me. And, yeah, it's always fun talking with you. So. All right. Thanks again. <laughs> This concludes this episode of Verdant Interviews. If you'd like to hear more interesting conversations with new guests, you can find these discussions on my YouTube channel, Verdant Interviews, on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com forward slash Verdant Interviews, or on my Weebly blog at verdantinterviews.weebly.com. You can also follow me on Facebook under the tag at Verdant Interviews for other updates and information. <laughs>